particular subject. Um, I work primarily, I'm a senior lecturer in, in advertising and marketing at the University of Notre Dame in Sydney, Australia. Um, and I tested this over a couple of years and it's actually quite relevant at this point in time as for the last semester and for the rest of this year where we're all teaching online um, totally with no face-to-face. Um, -face. So it was a good opportunity to uh, test out some ideas relating to an immersive digital experience that was actually going to work both from a lecturer point of view but also from a student point of view. And when I first started looking at this area and, and did a literature, literature um, search, there were four things that really stood out to me. The first was the making the distinction between active learning and passive learning. Um, and often when you're dealing with a, a, a pre prescribed uh, teaching situation where you might have a lecture followed um, at a separate point in time by tutorials, uh, you find, well, certainly we find in this part of the world that the lectures um, after the first few weeks, a lot of the students don't even bother to turn up. Uh, and when they do turn up, uh, they look, they're all very busy with their phones or computers. You hope actually taking notes, but the reality is it's more like Facebook and um, uh, YouTube and things like that. Um, so trying to take out that passive learning from the classroom, which is essentially what a lecture is, um, and then putting that in an environment where students will be encouraged to work with it at their own pace, but at the same time, obviously, you've got to bring them on the journey from little knowledge to start with to a point where they become hopefully more expert in a particular area. Um, and in looking at flipping classrooms generally, um, the paper by Enfield struck me as, as really coming to the crux of the issues. The first was that the classroom activity quite often when people convert to online has not been adapted. And I know a lot of my colleagues found that when they were forced about week three of the semester, last semester, to take what they had planned for, for physical delivery to, to put it online. Um, and if you don't adapt your material to suit the online environment, it, it generally means there's a lack of engagement and the learning doesn't take place. The second one is more technical in terms of quality and access issues, um, making sure that students have the ability to, to both get access to the material and that it's, uh, it's not uh, causing them any uh, particular problem. For example, in terms of internet connection or access to the right sort of uh, computer or system. And the last one, obviously, is student engagement. How do we make sure that the students are more engaged throughout a particular unit rather than um, just as a number of students do? Uh, cram everything into week 12 and 13 and then uh, try and pass an exam. So with those cautions in mind, I wanted to test um, a concept that I developed in the commercial sector, sector which is this idea of a, a, a Socratic model, um, which is the Fourie's Socratic model, which I've published on uh, before, but adapting it to a learning situation. So to do that, I used uh, the idea of chunking, which I found works incredibly well when, when you're dealing with students online who are used to a maximum of attention span of a five minute uh, YouTube video or something like that, that you don't present them with a, a long sort of lecture that where they just have to, uh, have to sit there. So by chunking the activity based on different levels linked to Bloom's framework, for example, uh, from things that they have to prepare for before we interact um, either physically or through, uh, say, a live Zoom session as we're doing now, um, and things that they actually have to physically do. The last part of it was, was um, putting some sort of group activity in there because I found uh, when I was exploring this that one of the things students missed the most was this 
personal interaction with other students. Because everyone out there seems to feel that they are maybe alone in having a particular problem. Um, whereas if they have a chance to talk to other students, they are perhaps not afraid to ask questions. They are not afraid to appear, uh, let's say that they, uh, they don't know anything about uh, the subject. And it also means that they are much more likely to take part in, in discussions than if, if it was otherwise. So uh, designing a uh, course based on that chunking approach, um, I tried, uh, and because this was a, 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 a testing situation where we tried to test out different things and it was done with a, a um, advertising marketing course. So with that Socratic approach, I tried to make sure that everything that we did was in answer to specific questions that I posed at the start of a, of a session or a week's work. So that then tended to guide the students reading and also enabled me to produce a short introduction um, that say they are they are used to, to, to this type of approach with a video, for example, that poses those questions in such a way that it makes it more appealing, shall we, shall we say. Um, so rather than just saying we're, we're talking about um, uh, competitive positioning, we pose a question relating to it that people hopefully think, um, yeah, I wonder what that's about, or I wonder what the answer is, rather than giving them a pre-considered um, answer yourself. And that approach is, um, I supported by a weekly work plan, which was published in advance, that broke down those four chunks I mentioned, um, so that students knew where they were at and what they actually had to do, rather than waiting to, you know, what's next, or how long is this going to take, or something like that. So I found also that, that using a Zoom uh, introductory video actually worked well in terms of selling the material and increasing the level of interest and engagement that the students had. Um, and also by the, and that part of it, by physically delivering it myself, um, I tried to make sure that students felt that there was somebody in front of them, even though they were um, effectively self-directed learning in, in, a, in that sort of environment. The second part of it um, was a live lecture component, which was either online or in person. Um, in the second uh, last semester when, uh, when we were working, that was actually just all online. Um, and the idea of that was to expand on the pre-reading and also to encourage some sort of interaction. Um, it also made it easy for students to comment, I found, much more so on Zoom than when they were live. So you'd always get the same two or three students putting up their hands in a live lecture. But on Zoom, the students are much more likely, I found, to actually um, comment um, using the, the, the chat function um, rather than um, having to put their hand up and physically say something, which uh, for a lot of students, um, they are not comfortable with doing it. I tried to keep my live sessions to 40 minutes at the most, 30 to 40 minutes, um, because I found that any longer than that, um, people start to drift away and their concentration um, is, is not so high. And also I found that students tend to um, not show themselves on the video. So you, you as a lecturer, it's, it's quite often hard because you don't have any idea of the impact the, that your words are having on, on the, the students themselves. The next um, chunk was for students to go away. Um, and this material was live over a whole week, so they didn't actually have to do it there and then if it wasn't convenient or if they weren't uh, confident in their knowledge. Um, and that also gave me the ability to uh, be available for questions or for them to comment outside of the live sessions. And to make sure that they actually worked with that uh, 
self-directed material, I made sure we included some assessment, accessible item that was based on that material. And those accessible items were either something to do with a uh, portfolio or sometimes uh, it might have been a, a quiz that had to be completed by a certain time. Um, and as I said, this process often resulted in many more questions than I would have had um, in a normal live situation. And the last chunk was the group activities. Many of my units actually have a group component anyway, um, but even where there was no group uh, component, I found that getting group discussions going um, and setting them tasks based on that discussion actually helped both engagement and the um, assimilation of knowledge in the, in the particular area. So that was the approach I tried uh, over a, a whole semester and adapted it based on my experience. Um, and at the end of it, I looked at first uh, reflection, how did it go in, in, in terms of any insights I gained from the process um, based on those questions, those cautions that I talked about originally. So the first part, adaption, worked really well by using those specific uh, questions and examining them in, in turn. Um, and then followed by that self-directed activity where they could work with the, the theory and it, I could give them activities that demonstrated it in action rather than just here is a theory, this is what somebody thinks um, without challenging them to be engaged with it. Uh, the quality and access issues I, I resolved by using uh, the Blackboard um, program that all of our students work with. And my material was put together with a SCORM um, package, which had all of the material uh, as part of it, rather than, uh, say, a document they had to download or something like that. It was uh, a way of interacting that made it easy for them to in, engage. And of course that engagement um, worked with the accessible quizzes and other things that I, activities that I had as part of the overall um, program. So at the end of uh, all of this, I developed a hypothesis that basically this approach actually worked. Um, and then put together a simple uh, questionnaire that I administered online and it was anonymous, asking those uh, questions, basically checking on the one hand motivation and secondly engagement. Um, I didn't relate it to uh, testing, um, say overall marks, because that would have to be done uh, using uh, different groups and over a period of time. But I was mainly concerned that that ap approach of chunking using a, a Socratic um, teaching method would actually uh, work. The results were overwhelmingly positive. Um, there were 49 students in the class, 31% of them uh, filled out the form anonymously online and overwhelmingly agreed that both their understanding and engagement was enhanced over a normal um, lecturing situation. And in fact, 93% of them preferred the, that model over a traditional approach. Uh, and 87% recommended that they would like it for other um, co courses or, or in fact, all of the units. Um, which is much more promising than, say, some of the, the um, research I've seen on flipped classroom models. And also the last question was asking for um, specific feedback um, using a qualitative um, type of response. And I just picked out these two comments because they were quite typical of what the students um, mentioned and, and talked about. In fact, one of the key insights I gained from this whole approach was that one 
students became better prepared. And in fact, having those quizzes online and having them uh, quizzes and other activities that had to be done by a certain time actually made many of them quite competitive. Um, and if they got a question wrong, they were quite quick to come back to me and say, well, hey, why was this wrong? Or I, I or in, even in some case argue that, that, that their answer was better than the right answer that I thought um, that I put in the quiz. Um, the participation also lasted throughout the whole semester rather than tapering off, uh, which was uh, typical in a physical um, lecture. 